Okay, welcome everyone to Pre-Dental Universe. This is Sherry and Sharif. Yes. We'd like to welcome you all to our very first session and we are grateful to have Dr. Mark Limusani. He will be sharing his dental journey with us today, as well as some of the cases. And without further ado, let's get started. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, we'll be happy to be speaking to you all. Um, um, I'm actually in my native Montreal, Canada. That's why I'm wearing a sweater, even though I live in South Florida and that's where I practice. Um, so this, interestingly enough, this lecture was the, the same lecture that I gave to the South Florida District Dental Association. It's very, very content rich. Um, I'm going to really expand on my intro and kind of we'll, we'll get through the presentation relatively quickly. There might be a lot of this that is like, whoa, this is way over my pay grade, but if that's fine. I'll just kind of give you guys a little bit of insight as to what I do. Um, so let's go for it. So, you know, one, one great element of stepping into a new career is that you don't have any anchors. Um, so you, you're kind of, going in as a blank slate, just willing to learn and problem solve, um, like kind of a white belt in jujitsu, uh, which is something I practice. Um, so, so oftentimes what you'll come to find is the more you know, at one point, the more you get anchored into your, your way of thinking. And sometimes you have to unlearn certain processes or certain ways of thinking that you've developed in order to have breakthroughs. Um, so because of the fact I was addressing my community, I was, I was, uh, I brought them to their attention uh, the whole idea of what Henry Ford as a visionary of the automobile had said that if he had asked people what they wanted, uh, their answer would have been they want faster horses. Um, so it's, it's a question of looking at challenges in our world and lo looking at it with a fresh pair of eyes so that you can um, basically be a clearing to that possible innovation evolution of, of your own field. So I always like to break down my, my thoughts into philosophy um, in a sense that in the world, uh, we're always distinguishing between uh, concepts and, and information that we're aware of, things that we're conscious of. Um, and then in this whole other realm of, of exploration of the world is where you'll find what's what we're either unaware of, things that we had never even heard about. And endodontics uh, was one of those things. When I was in high school, I'd never even heard of endodontics. It, it, it actually came to the point where I'd, I entered dental school that I found out that there was a, such a thing as a specialist in root canals. So root canal specialty was something that I was unaware of. And then guess what? I ended up making a whole career out of it. Um, and I still am doing so. Um, so, so one of the one of the concepts I always like approaching uh, when when lecturing is the idea of nothing is right or wrong. I mean, within a framework of morality, naturally, there's there are certain things that you believe to be right and other things that you believe to be wrong. But inherently, um, the world has not identified. We we all make agreements as to what's right or wrong. But but in 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 that exploratory phase of the world. If you're looking at ways to problem solve or, or ways, different ways of becoming um, different professions to choose from, it, it's a good idea to look at them from a perspective of possibility. What's out there, what is possible, what's achievable, what is um, something that a problem set that you'd be excited, to, excited to, to solve and what do you want to apply your talents to? As opposed to looking at things in a very binary manner, uh, this is good, that's bad, this guy studied this and that's bad, this is good, people like this do that, surgeons do this, uh, oncologists are like that, dentists are like this, that's all a fabrication in your head. Um, you know, you can look at, look at a profession uh, or a craft in, the, in its most purest fashion, and that's where, where you can really gain an appreciation for what, what we do, whether it's an endodontist, orthodontist, a cardiac surgeon, it's all within the realm of possibility. So this is a little bit about me and where I'm from. I'm actually here now, uh, that's not always the case. Um, I'm originally from Montreal, Canada. Um, yes, I do speak French. Um, I graduated from one of the two uh, dental schools in all of North America, the University of Montreal. 
Um, and uh, after that, for whatever reason, I was really compelled uh, to move south um, for my education, but also somewhat for lifestyle. Um, so now, almost 10 years ago, I graduated from Nova Southeastern University, and that's where I did my specialty training in endodontics. Um, and that's the root canal specialty. And, um, and since then, I've decided to make South Florida my home. And these are, these are my beautiful wife and kids, Valentina and Luciano and their Leonardo. And he didn't agree to have his face painted. That was uh, Photoshop. So, uh, and this is my, so that was my um, home team. And this is my office team. So um, since graduating, I was an associate. Uh, for four years. I was actually practicing in both um, Quebec City, Quebec, uh, for one week a month. And I would practice the rest of my time in the South Miami area. So I had two great mentors, both, um, Dr. Joe Barros and Marie Gosselin, who really gave me that, that, um, that, that one up um, after graduation. Um, and after spending four years under their guidance, I um, opened up my own practice. So it's been six years that I opened Weston Endodontic Care, which is a suburb in a suburb of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And that's where I basically built my practice. Um, this was a plug for actually, I'll have you know, seeing as though you're, you know, you're considering dental school. Uh, this year, I was part of the campaign for the first. Uh, Hispanic and Floridian um, dentists become president of the American Dental Association. So this is Cesar Sabatez. He's a, a general dentist in Coral Gables. Um, and he's basically achieving the highest uh, position in terms of uh, leadership uh, in, in organized dentistry. So kudos to Cesar. And I was very proud to, to help serve on his campaign. So this is this is our team, and you can see there's all kinds of young, young, old, or more seasoned people, but they were all involved in 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 making this campaign a success. Um, so we'll get into a little bit of the nitty gritty of what I do, um, and I'll kind of try and bring it to to a more palatable sense so you guys can understand, you know, a little bit what what I do and what all that stuff that I post on Instagram is really all about. Uh, just as a professional disclosure, I do lecture and get paid for um, my lectures um, on behalf of two uh, dental companies, Sunendo, which is the maker of the Gentle Wave, which I'll discuss, and SS White, which is a, a company that sells endodontic instruments, uh, both uh, burrs to access these teeth and, and uh, files uh, that serves to create uh, shape within the root canal system. So this is a typical radiograph. You can probably see a lot of these on Instagram. Uh, this is called the peri uh, periapical. So we're looking at the, um, the tip of the roots of the teeth. We can see a little bit of the sinus. Uh, the tooth that's in the middle is tooth number three, and it's filled with uh, a rubber material called gutta percha. And we can see that it's filled to the tip of the root. Um, the reason why I bring this up is oftentimes as endodontists, this becomes our, you know, uh, uh, the, the most important x-ray that we tend to look at. Um, however, we do miss a lot of detail. First of all, when looking at a two-dimensional two-dimensional image, and second of all, this image has some level of distortion, so we're missing. Uh, we're, we don't really have an appreciation of how much actual tooth structure is left after the original treatment is complete. This uh, image gives us a little bit more information. It's called a bite wing X-ray. It gives us the top teeth and the bottom teeth. Um, oftentimes, that's used to take a look at. Uh, um, basically, if there's any decay or there's defective uh, restorations, crowns, bridges, fillings, things of that nature. But from an endodontist perspective, as a root canal specialist, what I have to look at is how much tooth structure is left after an original treatment was done. So what you have to understand is any intervention on the dentition or on teeth, it's irreversible in nature. You can't put back tooth structure. All tooth that you remove, seeing as though we're working on hard tissue that doesn't regenerate on its own, is to be removed for good. So all the materials that we use, whether it's gray amalgam or silver filling, gold, porcelain, zirconia, 
uh, composite resin. All of these are substitutes to the natural dentition, but we're never restoring, uh, we're never actually regenerating tooth structure. Uh, so we need to be mindful when we're accomplishing our root canal goals, um, the collateral damage that is created by trying to accomplish our, our goals of cleaning out the inside of these teeth. So, you know, to, to create a bit of a parallel, there is a big revolution when laparoscopy uh, came into vogue with general surgery or uh, gastroenterology, urology, uh, robotics. These, these, these breakthroughs in technology really make for better healing times, um, less likelihood of infection. Uh, but in our case, seeing as we're working on hard tissue, all the concepts of laparoscopy, enhanced magnification and illumination, really make such for lo uh, increased, lo more likelihood of increased tooth longevity. Why? Because you end up removing less hard tissue, which makes it such that these teeth have more of a potential to last a longer period of time. Um, so this is, um, pretty much a snapshot of the modern endodontic office. Um, I work with a dental operating microscope it, uh, along with assistant magnification. So both myself and my assistant are in that field of view at the same time uh, treating these cases at high magnification. Um, I have uh, ultrasonic that are used to basically clean deeper inside the root canal or inside that chamber of the tooth. Um, and find these pathways in, into the tips of it that will get all the way to the tips of the root. So what I try and contrast and compare, and what you have to understand in dentistry is we always we, we, you already start you always start somewhere and then you start evolving. But oftentimes the concepts upon which these uh, the basic principles, these gold standards were developed, were developed with limited magnification, so limited technology, limited illumination, meaning you can't really see what you're doing, and limited instruments, the armamentarium. So although you, you, you know, high speed or, or hand pieces, drills that could cut very efficiently were somewhat available, we didn't really have the ability to see inside the tooth very clearly. And that's why there was a series of principles that were based on more tactile sense without necessarily seeing. So there's two guys, uh, a restorative dentist and a, and a root canal specialist that came together and put their ideas together to be able to come up with a different way of looking at things. Um, and that's where basically conservative endodontics and a new approach to entering the inside of the tooth uh, came into vogue. Um, so in dentistry in general, um, there's really a lot of things that have come into play uh, that have made it such that we've had to move on with the times and we can't stay behind. Otherwise, we're really not offering the best care to our patients. Um, implants or dental implants, the removal of the entirety of the tooth, the crown, the part that we see in the mouth, and also the uh, foundations, which the root are all removed. Those, uh, the bone, uh, which is the area in which the roots are anchored, it needs to be preserved and then a screw goes into the bone which is a dental implant that is a more more of a revolutionary uh, treatment that has a proven track record so saving the natural dentition has to really basically prove itself uh, compared to this uh, this alternative uh, means of, of solving a problem uh, which is the dental implant nowadays we have microscopes that allow us to see a lot more clearly Biomimetic dentistry, which makes it such that the principles of removing decay or um, creating preparations inside the tooth have changed based on the new materials that we have. Minimally invasive dentistry, trying to remove less um, and the aesthetic demands of the patient. Patients not only want something that works, they want something that looks good. Um, so th those are all things that are pushing dentistry uh, to the limit to be able to offer the best care possible. Uh, for our patients. So we're always in this balancing act. Um, ourselves as the operators are constantly trying to, um, you know, we're working in a very restrained field. The mouth is pretty a pretty small space. In root canal specialty, it's even smaller because we're working inside the, the um, basically inside the, the opening of the tooth itself to be able to gain access to the inside of the root. So all of our measurements are within fractions of a millimeter, uh, let's say half millimeter is, is basically where, where our realm is. 
Um, so we're the operator. We're working on a very specific tissue type, which is the dental, the dental tissue, dentin, the pulp, um, and basically um, the enamel um, and uh, restore. And then we're also working within the realm of the materials that we have at our disposition, whether it's composite resin, uh, um, um, gold, uh, silver fillings, or amalgam, and so on and so forth. So we're trying to create a balance between the two uh, elements, and that's where the endodontic, which is the inside of the tooth, endorestorative, which is the junction between the inside of the tooth and uh, the part that we see in the mouth, the crown, prosthodontic, which is basically the part that we try and restore, the prosthetic, a crown would be a prosthetic version of a natural tooth, and a continuum. So it's, it basically starts from the tip of the root all the way to the crown. And so the difference that we're noticing is if in the past we had to create, we had to remove a significant amount of tooth structure more in order to access the inside of the tooth. Why? Because we had a very stiff instrument uh, that were used to ream out the inside of the tooth. And B, we didn't have enough light uh, a strong enough light source to be able to actually see what we we're doing. So oftentimes a lot of what we were doing was very tactile. We would just feel as opposed to actually seeing. Uh, and for those reasons, you had something called straight line access, which would make for a lot more removal of tooth structure. Nowadays, we remove a lot less tooth structure and we're able to accomplish our goals more effectively. So what it looks like on an X-ray is it looks like a very, very small opening on the top of the tooth. The inside of the roots of the tooth are these white lines are much more narrow as opposed to being much more larger, whiter, and brighter. Um, and, but, but we're still keeping in mind our uh, desire to fill the entirety of the inside of the tooth from the top of the tooth all the way to the tip of the roots. And that's the, the, the projections that you're seeing are basically the roots of the teeth uh, that are anchored into that fuzziness, which is the, the jawbone itself. And so those images that you're seeing are basically under a microscope. Uh, we have the ability to access inside, in this case, the crown of a tooth. We clean the entirety of the inside of that space, and then we seal it in a very seamless manner, as you can see on the lower right portion of the screen. That's after placing that filling material. So this is another example, very, very conservative treatment. And the image on the right, as opposed to just showing a simple white line to the tip of the root, you see all this anatomy at the tip of the root that's sealed off, uh, which are different um, exit points through which bacteria would be able to survive and thrive and maintain an inflammatory process, which is what we don't want. Um, so we've come to the realization that not all tooth structure is, is equal in terms of its value. Um, the highest value would be the tissue around the neck of the tooth, because that's the tissue that uh, uh, receives more shearing force, uh, more likelihood of breakage or snap off or fracture. Um, so that was deemed the highest. And the higher you go uh, in terms of uh, closer to the, the surface of the teeth, the less value, because the more the more the, e the easier it is for us to replace that tissue with little little to no consequence. Um, so what we understand is the more tooth structure that we remove from the inside portion of the tooth, the more likelihood of flexure occurs uh, to these to, to the rest of the tooth structure, and the more likelihood you have of either decay settling at the junction of your filling material or uh, actual breakage that occurs. Um, in which case the patient comes to the office with the crown in their hands and we have to kind of find a solution as to how we can now try and save their tooth. So, so again, the idea that these, the inside of the tooth is a very straightforward um, pathway from the inner chamber to the tip of the root is, um, that would be a legacy concept. The idea that it was just a one, one highway from end to end um, a guy by the name of Walter Hess uh, in the 40s uh, basically noted that these, the anatomy inside the tooth is extremely complex. There's all kinds of webbing and uh, fins and astomosis, uh, isthmus uh, areas um, where bacteria can uh, 
basically survive and thrive if those areas aren't cleaned out adequately. Um, so now we're kind of moving into the next phase of, of endodontics where as opposed to only using two-dimensional x-rays uh, to diagnose and treat these teeth, we're now using what's called cone beam computed tomography or CBCT, which allows for us to slice through each and every one of these uh, teeth, all the tooth structure, analyze bone loss and have a better understanding of where the bone loss is coming from, why it's occurring, teeth, tooth was, uh, teeth were already treated, understand where the shortcomings were in that initial treatment, um, certain situations such as resorption or inflammatory processes that have gone out of whack, uh, we're able to have a better understanding of where the, they're located and what's the likelihood of us being able to solve the problem. Uh, fractures to understand where these fractures are occurring and what consequences uh, have uh, have uh, incurred because of these fractures and a whole bunch of other things, namely, you know, planning for surgery and things of that nature gives us a lot more precision. Um, so, for instance, root canal anatomy. Some of these teeth normally we would be, uh, we're accustomed to seeing, um, especially in premolars on top teeth, which is basically the teeth after the canine, we're normally accustomed to seeing two roots and two canals associated with them. But there are some instances where there's actually three, three um, canal spaces, and that makes our treatment a little bit more complex because you have to get your instruments into those little nooks and crannies. Um, and that's where a three-dimensional x-ray shows a lot more, is a lot more, much more precise. On the image, to the lower, uh, right of your screen, you could see that little, that wishbone, that bifurcation that's occurring. So knowing that ahead of time allows for us to prepare uh, ourselves and know, okay, for instance, well, that bifurcation is occurring at 15 millimeters from the top of the tooth. I'm going to drill down to here, and then I'm going to start fishing around with my little little instruments and kind of gives me a, a, lay, uh, a map of, of what to expect before even starting to remove tooth structure. And, and that's a very, very small opening that I was able to use to accomplish my goal, um, which was to basically clean the inside of the tooth to the tip of the root. And you can see that little wishbone is, is totally filled with um, rubber filling material or gutta percha. So in, nowadays, we're also using this technology uh, to prevent what's called iatrogenic mishap, meaning dentist-related uh, uh, false coming. Um, where you thought you were able to address something and things don't work out the way you plan, what you had planned. Um, you remove less tooth structure because you know exactly where you're going and you minimize the amount of exposure to x-rays because with one x-ray, you're able to get a lot more information um, on the front end as opposed to having to take multiple x-rays uh, during treatment. So this is an example of a, a dentist that has already started the treatment and then referred the case to me. Um, this is a picture under the microscope, and that's basically the inside of the tooth. Uh, what's very particular about the situation is there's all this little, little area where bacteria can, um, can house themselves um, and, and create uh, an, a persistent infection. And so this is basically me manipulating the scan, and we have ways of dynamically working through this image so as opposed to being a static image that you're just looking at and interpreting you you can move through it and examine each and every one of these teeth um, it has re a resolution of 70 75 uh, voxels so uh, that's the smallest uh, unit of measurement of a three-dimensional volume if a pixel would be the, a picture element the smallest unit of, of an image a voxel really gives us that uh, that level of precision, but in, in all those three dimensions. Uh, so it really allows for us to have a much clearer understanding of, of what we're dealing with um, and what's been done in the past. So this is an image under the microscope, uh, dental operating microscope. So those little, that little darkness that you're seeing is after there's a certain level of um, shaping and cleaning that's been created to address that inner anatomy of the inside of a tooth. Um, and that's just basically a different perspective showing that other little canal on the upper right aspect. So what, what, we're, what you're actually looking at is uh, a magnified image through a mirror. 
So this is actually a, um, uh, seeing as though we're working through a mirror, working through the microscope, we take a picture through the mirror image of the microscope, and, and that's what you're seeing here. And, and there's that orange uh, materials we use to fill the inside of the tooth. And that's the final product uh, where you see that the space uh, has been filled with that white filling material all the way to the tip of that that uh, that outline, which is represents the tip of the root. Um, it you know cracked teeth are a big challenge uh, in dentistry in general. When we're dealing with cracks, depending on how deep these cracks are, uh, sometimes it makes it such that we're not in a position to save these teeth. Uh, so in this type of a situation, um, just based on that three-dimensional image, it allowed for me to have an understanding that we were dealing with a crack that was going down the side of the root. So I made the call. I, I, I let the patient know the prognosis was more guarded because of my, my suspicion that there was a crack. And sure enough, after having the tooth removed, uh, there you can see in, in dark, that's the, the staining related to the crack in uh, that is going uh, basically uh, down the side of the root of the tooth, uh, which was in fact more of a guarded situation in terms of being able to save that tooth in the long run. So nowadays we have what's called guided endodontics, where we have the overlay of information um, in, in that three-dimensional x-ray with um, with camera, so you have a camera that's sitting above you, and so as you're working, uh, you simultaneously are getting feedback on, in real time on that three-dimensional X-ray. So, I mean, for all you guys that are gamers out there, it's very, very, very much so like playing a video game. It's kind of it, it really it it's it's very unnerving because you're not looking at the patient; you're literally looking at the screen. And in this case, your goal is basically to keep those two circles uh, and, and keep them concentric, meaning in line with one another. And so long as you stay in line, that means that you're basically uh, aiming directly down the barrel or down the entry point of the tooth and allows for us to make a much, much more conservative opening. In this case, this is Dr. Maupin, a colleague of mine out of um, uh, Lubbock, Texas. And he's basically entering into the tooth in real time. And you could actually see in real time as he's entering the inside of the tooth, um, you know, his, his, where his drill is and where he's going. Kind of like interventional radiology to a certain extent. Um, so these are the very, very small openings that we're able to create inside these teeth to be able to accomplish our goals. Um, and, and clean out the inside of these teeth. And so this is just, you know, different images. Um, oftentimes, especially when these canals are very constricted, uh, it's much more challenging to make these very conservative opening, but with this guided technology, it allows for us to do it. Uh, it allows for that even to be possible. That was something, you know, right and wrong, the realm of possibility. That was something that other people would deem uh, the tooth to be hopeless, uh, because there was, it was the canals were too narrow, and we'd be unable to to accomplish our, our goals. Nowadays, that's that's a possibility. So you know, the, the challenge that we always have is we want to address all the anatomy inside these teeth, but we want to minimize the collateral damage. We don't want to remove tooth structure unnecessarily. Um, so again, this is what we're dealing with. We're trying to clean out all of these little intricate areas inside the tooth without removing so much tooth structure that would then weaken it. So that's when this, this new device has come into play. Early adopters have started using it in 2016. Um, so I was one of, I was basically the third endodontist in Florida, no, excuse me, the fourth endodontist in the state of Florida to use uh, the gentle wave. Um, it's a basically a new way of being able to clean the inside of these teeth without necessarily having to create such a large shape all the way to the tip of the root. So, um, so we're basically optimizing our way of moving fluid throughout the inside, these little intricate areas inside of the tooth. 
um, which makes it such that we don't have to open these teeth up to larger sizes, which removes less tooth structure and makes it such that these, the inside of these teeth are clean more efficiently. So I'll just show you guys a little video so you have a little uh, better understanding of, of how this technology makes um, our job a little bit easier. So obviously this is from the company itself, but it, it really kind of gives gives you a better idea of how uh, we've they've gone about cleaning inside of the tube. So again, this is the by sitting in the inside of the tube and through the moving uh basically some energy with throughout the tube. So constantly replenish the fluid inside and removing, disinfecting, dividing all the areas of the inside of the tooth, including what's called the dental tubules, so the porous, so the dental tubules that you're seeing right now, the porous component of the, the dentin, which is the inner portion of the tooth. And we basically are able to clean all the, the, the inside of the tooth very thoroughly using this, this new technology. So advanced fluid dynamics, uh, our ability to move fluid throughout the inside of the tooth more effectively and using multisonic energy, which allows to uh, vibrate different elements um, and different spaces inside the tooth and, and uh, makes it such that we have better cleaning. So you can see here in these types of situations, we're able to open these teeth uh, very minimally uh, while uh, really uh, having the ability to clean the inside much more thoroughly. And so this is a perfect case. You know, we have uh, basically an, uh, an abscess on the side of the root tooth. This is a probe that's, that's showing that the, um, there's, there's a loss of attachment all the way down the side of the root of the tooth through this infection inside. This is the inside of the root of the tooth that's filled. You can see normally these teeth only have one canal. This one had two with an offshoot to the side. And uh, only three months later, you could start seeing the bone filling in um, and that prodding, which was before all the way down to the, the root tip is now about two, three millimeters, which is great. Um, so, you know, even the, the evidence supports this, uh, this new way of doing things. The only challenge is there's no like double-blinded randomized uh, control studies. Uh, you know, multi-center studies, those are in effect. I'm actually part of one of them. Um, so they, you know, in our office, we, we do research as well uh, to allow, uh, to ensure that this technology uh, not only is uh, doing, giving the same results as the, the previous way of doing things, but in fact, is doing better. Um, this is actually a case that- This is that, examination. Uh, I sent to um, one of my mentors. So. Just to let you know, like the community in general is always very open to sharing and learning new things. So this is the case that I did. We came to the conclusion that the tooth was cracked. Um, so uh, what was done is I basically cleaned out the inside of the tooth. I used that device to disinfect everything inside uh, the root canal space. Um, and then once we realized that there was no hope, Basically, I filled it and then I sent it to uh, Dr. Carr, who's a friend of mine in San Diego. He's basically one of the pioneers of using uh, microscopes in, in root canal therapy. Um, you could see, you know, on that, that blackness on the side of the root is all bone loss. So the infection is happening inside the root of the tooth, um, but that's creating uh, inflammatory response on the outside of the root of the tooth that's creating bone loss. So that's that bone loss that we're seeing here is on the cheek side of the tooth. So all that bone loss was created by uh, the infection. See that that line, that white, that line that's uh, filled with white material is the crack. And all that in, inner portion of the tooth was filled with um, a filling material uh, such as uh, gutta percha and a bioceramic uh, filling material. And so you basically, I'm going to fast forward. So what Dr. Card was gracious enough to do is he basically uh, uh, sectioned these teeth. There you could see the cracked section, the tooth, 
and there's the exit point. So he sectioned these teeth in multiple different slices. There's all those different slices of the inside of a tooth, and you could see that it's filled with that white filling material. And on the side, you could see that area that had cracked. And this is basically uh, a tooth on a, a stereo uh, a scanning electron microscope, or SEM. Um, so you can see really the, the detail to which he was able to examine these teeth. And the most, the most important thing that he had noticed is even looking in those little intricate areas inside the tooth that are unable to be touched by um, normal uh, files, uh, what, you, what you, he was able to notice is there were no viable bacteria and no biofilm, which is a true advancement in, in technology. Um, that's, not, that's not the norm. That's not typical. Typically, those areas would be filled with bacteria and bacteria byproducts. Uh, if you would look at the way a tooth was traditional, uh, traditionally treated in that space in between those little orange dots, that's what's called an isthmus tissue. When you saw that webbing inside a tooth, that's the space in between the main channels or arteries. If you would look at that normally, um, you would see a significant or very established uh, bacterial biofilm there. Um, so using traditional methods, we know that we're, we don't have the ability to clean these teeth efficiently. So using traditional methods, we have to remove more tooth structure and we're, doing, we're less effective and efficient at doing our work. Um, whereas nowadays with, with the dental wave, we have that ability to clean these teeth a, a lot more effectively and leaving these uh, canals virtually uh, bacterial free. It's the closest thing we have so far to actually sterilizing uh, the root canal uh, system. So it's, it's pretty incredible what we're able to do um, nowadays. And so this is the, the this is unpublished work. It's totally anecdotal, but but very informative uh, because it's my own my own work. It's not some study. It's not. It's literally me doing a case in you know with my own hands and sending it off and seeing the results. Very very rewarding. Um, so like I said, you know we're seeing an improvement in the process of how we do things. We, we see that we're able to do things more efficiently from a disease center perspective. There's less bacterial biofilm. And from a patient-centered perspective, our patients are happier. Treatment is done in typically one setting, um, one sitting, um, and le a lot less post-operative pain, discomfort, and so on. Um, so, you know, in, like in anything, or you guys are pretty much at the crossroad, uh, where you're having to make decisions and that never changes even being professional board certified the whole thing you're i'm always having to place myself at an inflection point of okay am i going to adopt a new technology and examine to which point it'll have an impact on my practice or am i going to stay with the traditional methods and and just wait on the sidelines till i have you know, 20 years of follow-up when now something new has already come into vogue. Um, so that's something that's very likely gonna, gonna be a part of your, of your career path because there's so many disruptive technologies that are coming into to vogue. So, you know, one, one element that I like to bring to the table, whether I'm speaking to people in the dental sphere or not, um, whether I'm speaking to dental students or pre-dental or, or even endodontists, there's always, and this is from Mark Twain, there's always the things you know and the things that you don't know. But what, where all the exploration occurs is those things that you think you know that just ain't so. And that's where you're, you're basically exploring the world and finding your, your own version of the truth. So I definitely wanted to fly through this presentation. I know a lot of this is, is very, very technical. Um, I hope I was able to bring it down to a point where you guys felt comfortable with with what I was explaining. And you know, I'm I'm open to just ans answering any questions you had about my journey um, and, and anything that uh, that you're interested in asking. I'm more than happy to answer whatever questions you have. So well, I'll let you guys take the floor again, and 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 um, willing to 
hang out with you guys and, and answer answer any questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ilmasani, for today's presentation. It was definitely very- I think you're still muted. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Um, let's see. Are you Let me see if I can. I can't hear you. Okay. I hear that you're talking and I know that you're recording. Let's see how I can unmute you if I have the ability to do that. Can you unmute yourself? I'm unmuted. Mm, can you hear me? Okay, I we can't hear you. Okay. So if any of the participants wanna ask a question, uh, happy to do so. I don't know if there's a chat group. Yeah, here we go. So if you want to message me directly, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, can I go back to the x-ray slides? I'd like to look at them longer. Uh, you want, okay, so what I will do is I can definitely go back and I'll just leave the x-ray up. I don't know which one you want in particular. I'll choose this one. And then we can, I don't know if I have access to the chat now. Okay, if I had a chance, would I choose or explore a different specialty? No, I love my specialty. I mean, that's as direct as I could get with that answer. I'm super passionate. Um, I mean, I think you guys have pre-selected for someone that's very excited about what they do. Um, so, you know, I. I think that your level of enthusiasm towards your special, you move it, just like anything else in life, that's a circumstance that you made a choice to engage in. Um, so you make the most of it, you enjoy it. I mean, not all days are rosy, not all cases go smoothly, not all patients are super appreciative, but the goal is to just focus on the ones that are appreciative and and enjoy your life and, and, and be proud of what you do. Okay. Um, can I speak more on the residency process? Uh, sure. Um, uh, where did I go to residency and how is it compared to dental school curriculum before residency? Great question. Residency is a blast. Um, basically, um, you get to choose an area of dentistry that you want to devote a all of your attention to um, and oftentimes you're with colleagues that want to do the same so in my case we we're only six residents from a personal perspective what ended up happening is um, there were basically three there was one guy that was um, already more or less engaged and three single guys myself and two colleagues uh, one of them started dating a period on resident got engaged and i started dating the sister then we got engaged, these guys got married, we got married, and the third one ended up marrying my wife's best friend. So not only did we have a great collegial um, environment, we also have basically lifelong friends. Um, it was a very demanding program, but when you're already very passionate about one specific aspect of dentistry, um, doing a dental specialty is, is wonderful, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I would say the curriculum is different because the way I can explain this is once you've actually gone through the process of 
developing your hand skills and you feel a little bit more comfortable with that element of, of, uh, of the dental world, you're just kind of really honing in on a much more narrow skill set. Um, so that's, that's very rewarding. Um, it's very enjoyable. Um, that's like, I would explain, I would, I would compare it to like, well, if ever you've tried a musical instrument or sport or a, a form of art, those, that initial time that you kind of have that instrument in your hand, I mean, unless you're like a virtuoso, it's kind of awkward. You, you're kind of fumbling around. Um, but then when you get really good at something and you just want, you know, you just want to keep doing it, that, that would be a similar um, feeling to once you're in residency and things are starting to gel and, and you kind of get that, that level of your kind of, you're a little bit closer to developing some level of mastery in a craft. Someone asked, hello, is it better to pose, to do a post back or get a master's degree to boost science GPA? Which one is better for dental school? Oh my God, that is, you, first of all, I'm Canadian. So I don't know to what degree that applies to me. Uh, our system is pretty different. Um, I would, from what I, my understanding is, dentistry is quite uh, competitive. But if you're passionate and you're really, um, you know, you have a strong desire to, to achieve that goal, then stick to it. Don't, don't, I mean, the only way I can answer that question is more philosophical and just don't take no for an answer and, and keep, keep going. Um, you, you know, you might come across a lot of roadblocks, but, but just keep at it. Um, was I a different school? Whoa. Was I, was I a different student in dental school than I was in undergrad? If so, how did I change? Also, how did I balance school, social, and health during dental school? Great question. So interestingly enough, I'm, I'm from the province of Quebec. This is the only province that has this, uh, it's called a CEGEP system, where you do high school, which is five years. Um, so there's no middle school. So we have five years of high school, then two years of like where you're doing your basic sciences. And then if your grades are strong enough, uh, you can get go straight into dental school. So I would say in that CEGEP, I, I was a pretty strong student and allowed me to get into dental school. Um, so um, I would say that in dental school, I was a, a I wasn't, I wasn't top of my class. Um, I was very passionate. I kind of knew early on that I wanted to go into endodontics just because of the technology, the precision. I had good mentors. Um, you know, social life revolves around um, your dental school friends. Um, my health revolves, I mean, when you're young, you, you have the ability to make more sacrifice. I mean, there's a lot of people that make a heck of a lot more sacrifices than dental school students. Like, if you want to become a Navy SEAL or, you know, there, there are bigger sacrifices that other people are making. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and, <clears throat> and tell you that, um, you know, we're making the biggest sacrifice in the world, but, but it's a commitment. And if you're committed to doing something, then, then you'll do it um, regardless of, of, you know, you know that that's not forever um, and you really want to make the most of it. Um, do I recommend taking a gap year to do dental assisting? No, I mean if that if that if that's something that falls on your plate, then go for it. Um, interestingly enough, both of my uh, dental team members are actually dentists. They're foreign trained, so they're going back and going through that whole process all over again, and they're just as passionate as I am. So I mean, I will say that if that is something that happens then embrace it and, and try and get, you know, assist a very qualified dentist, someone that has a really good reputation, is passionate. Um, so, yeah. Would I recommend Canadian students to apply to American dental schools? Um, if you're really, really hell-bent on becoming a dentist, um, and for whatever reason, you don't feel that you're going to be able to get into dental school in Canada, then then yeah, um, I would say that, I mean, if there was, if you were like on the cusp, and it was only a question of doing a couple more years worth of, uh, of studies in Canada to then get into a Canadian dental school, I'd be more inclined to stay 
um, just from a financial perspective, because you're going to save a heck of a lot more money uh, doing it that way. Um, I, I was very fortunate to have done my studies here in Quebec. It was at the fraction of the cost of a lot of my dental colleagues. Um, so that allowed me to be much more empowered at this point in time in my life. I'm only 38 years old and I've already, you know, been a, a practice owner for six years. So, so it's, it's that's a real blessing and uh, vice versa. Um, if you're Canadian applying to America, I would say, I do believe that it's much more of a challenge for an American to get into a Canadian dental school. I'm not certain about that, but I'm pretty, that that's, I've not really heard of that very frequently for Americans going to Canadian dental schools. But if that's a possibility, I'd definitely look into it. Um, and that seems about it for questions. I'm again happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, if not, I'm giving the floor to our host. Oh, here you go. I can ask you to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, Okay. great. Well, I would like to thank you so much for your time and for this wonderful presentation. It was definitely helpful and I'm sure a lot of our students were able to learn something new today. And thank cool. you for the time to answer the questions that we had. And- um, That's my pleasure. Um, what I could do is I can, um, I'd be happy to, I'm gonna put my email in the chat Okay. Um, and if ever you guys have any questions, you can also DM me at Weston Endo Care, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, more than happy to, to respond to direct message. If you have any questions, happy to help you guys out. Yes, I'll definitely um, share with the students your email and your um, Instagram, and they can definitely cool. you whenever needed. Well, I'd like to thank cool. you for your time and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Same to you. Enjoy. You guys take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Bye-bye.